right. Thank you. Why, hello, everyone. So I calculated it. I have four seconds per slide. So please count the seconds and tell me if I'm going too slow, which I'm already going. That's, that's one slide. Anyway, so this is going to be Crypto Economics in Introduction, a course, CryptoEconomics.Study. So let's get started. Well, a couple weeks ago, I went to this awesome conference called EC18. And it's actually where Vitalik started, well, he was thinking about those gas models before, but he really like, started talking, to, at least talking to me about it there. And we, you know, this is like a mechanism design co a conference, algorithmic game theory, and you know, we talked about auctions and market design, and it was super, super fun. And by the way, this is a great book, Algorithmic Game Theory, and there's some lectures online if you want to take a look. So that was awesome. And, you know, the cool thing is I was talking to all these, you know, it was a very academic conference. I was talking to all these academics, and they had these really nice mechanisms. And they were like, you know, I really want this to be implemented. And it was really inspirational to actually see people talking about economics and talking, reasoning about cool mechanisms. And meanwhile, I spend a lot of my time at, you know, CryptoCon 2018. And there's, you know, a whole bunch of people there. And everyone's got, you know, an application and they're, they're working on and they're like trying to ship and everyone's rushing to ship. And I'm super excited. And we've got the fire, you know, lit under us. So it, it's been pretty exciting. But now there's these two sides that I, that I started to notice. And that is like the, the kind of application, uh, uh, you know, blockchain visionaries that really really, you know, believe in decentralization. And then there's these, you know, mechanism designers that I kind of uh, have been getting more and more, you know, getting more and more interactions with, thankfully. And the cool thing is uh, the combination of the two, right? We, we've got, on one hand, we've got the, the, these mechanism designers who really reason about uh, incentives and adversarial thinking and modeling strategies and all these things that we've been doing on, uh, you know, our research for quite some time. And then we have these web application developers and these, you know, people who want to, you know, build the future web, who have, you know, the ability to implement this stuff. So it's a really like combining the two. And so what I've been working on is a course called CryptoEconomics.Study. And this, this is kind of the, the intersection of these two things, where we're using crypto and we're using you know, application architecture design as well as incentives and modeling to kind of you know, blast off into the, the web 3.0 and you know, open source, privacy, decentralization, fair freedom, and you know, less risk when we, when we have our applications. We don't have those black swans and it causes this big uh, you know, ecosystem to grow up and develop. And you know, this has been done so far with only a few people who actually know crypto economics, though. This is the kind of strange thing, right? Only a couple people know this stuff. And really, we want the world to be made better from these, these you know, systems to make them more robust and make our internet less vulnerable to certain attacks. And so for that to actually happen, we need to spread the knowledge to as many, as many gerbils as possible. I'm into gerbils. These are superstar gerbils who know crypto economics, if you didn't notice. So, this is why I'm working on a course with actually Jing Lan over there. And this course covers core topics of you know, crypto economics, and it also goes over design patterns, and it has a coding project included. So this kind of gives you the, the full picture. It takes, takes you, whether you're a mechanism designer, whether you're a, you know, a web application developer, or you just kind of want to understand more about what this space is about. You know. And in the, through the course of this course, we're going to go over uh, like a central operator. This is a picture of a central operator, kind of payment processor that's sent, you know, for running transactions. And then we kind of turn that into a Bitcoin. We decentralize it with you know, proof of work and then later proof of stake. And then we take that even further and we attach it to an Ethereum plasma chain and start talking about layer two kind of technologies that you can use. So this is called CryptoEconomics.Study. It's live on the interwebs. There's some lectures that have already been posted. There's a book. There's a you know a, a, a form which you should please please get involved with, and there's all of us who are building it. So it's really this is it's really cool to build this course because it is an open source course. It is a you know full community effort. And so where are we are where are we now? Well, we have a course overview with a bunch of stuff that you can totally take a look at. There's chapter one, which has just been released and you know, has a bunch of different lectures given by me. And so if you, know, you can handle my energy, then you can do it. Um, and there's even been open source contributions from people that I'm not even like, good friends with who wrote you know,
know, the entire first chapter in, on the GitHub and like a pull request. So this is a really cool way to, to kind of get the community involved. And we also have a community called these, I replaced the heads with gerbils because I didn't ask for permission for that photo. Um, and there's a fun forum, right? All of these things that people are posting and, com and the community involvement is amazing. And I think this is really the way forward for decentralized projects. You know, focus on building a community, getting people involved from day one, release everything you have, because that's the best way to do it. And you know, you get t-shirts in the, in the, on the, along the way. So, great, and oh, by the way, there's a night mode on the website, that's cool. Um, so, OMG. Um, now, <laughs> just as a quick, quick you know, overview of the actual course, or some kind of uh, uh, give you some intuitions about what we're gonna be doing, I'm gonna just go over the payment processor Bitcoin plasma transformation and give you some intuition. So here's an implementation of that payment processor using an account model and really focus on state and state transitions. I'm very much into state and state transitions. It's kind of a core building block that allows you to build applications. Here's the state at time zero with one account and a, some balance. Here's a transaction send. And now we have a new state, which is you know the money is reduced in one account and increased in the other. So very simple. And so what we'll learn during this is you know hash functions and signatures. And, you know, that's pretty easy, not too bad so far, but who runs the code? So now we get into kind of where the decentralization runs in. So right now, the code is all being run on this central operator. And the, you know, transactions are being included in these kind of blocks, but those blocks are just, you know, maintained and run on this computer. So what, right now, all of these people are looking at that computer and saying, you know, give me your balance, you know, please allow me to send my money. And so that means that the central operator has a lot of power. And so some of the power that the central operator has, not everything, is like censorship, for instance. The central operator can choose to not include everyone's transactions or even delete some kind of some history. And fraud resistance, there's, you know, if the central, oper may, central operator may be collecting some amount of money and collect more and more and then just kind of bag it up and make off with it. Unfortunately, this is too real. Um, so. What we want to do is we want to remove that central operator. So we you know, take off its crown and give everyone else the computer so they're running the code instead of just the central operator running the code. And now we have this network of users, and they're all running this blockchain application, these blockchain nodes. And they're talking to each other, and they're sending transactions back and forth. However, we have a problem. What order are we going to send and apply these transactions? So, for instance, we have two transactions, one where the gold gerbil is sending to the brown, the other where the gold gerbil is sending to the white gerbil. So, which one comes first? These two both, these two were sent. Now, in the, in, and this is why it actually matters. In ordering number one, the gold gerbil is sending to the brown gerbil, and that's okay, because the gold gerbil has 10, and the brown gerbil now has 10. But now the gold gerbil has zero, and they're trying to send 10 more to the white gerbil. That is not okay, right? You've already sent all of your money. So in the end, the balances that we get are gold with zero, brown with 10, and white with zero. But now ordering number two, we send to the white gerbil first. That transaction goes through. The other transaction does not go through. And so we end up with different balances in one where the brown gerbil has the money and in one where the white gerbil has the money. And so, boom, we have this problem. Which one do we choose? So, of course, if we ask the brown gerbil, the brown gerbil is going to be like, mine was first, and the white gerbil is going to say, mine was first. So, uh, this is a bit of a problem. We need decentralized consensus. Before we had the central operator telling us which came first, now we need decentralized consensus. So, within this kind of section, we'll talk about client-side validation, the importance of that, synchrony assumptions, and, and a bunch more, actually. But now, decentralized consensus. Let's, let's break this up. So we're gonna take the central operator, turn it into something that looks a little like Bitcoin. So now we have all of our users and we have our miners and validators. This is a new entity that has kind of come about to solve this decentralized consensus problem. Now the users are the ones generating transactions and the miners are going to be determining the ordering of those transactions and you know, providing availability. So the important, an important property of these miners is that they can be freely joined by users. So users can go, you know, I'm a user now, no, I actually want to be a miner. That's pretty cool. And that is these porous borders is actually what allows this to be kind of a decentralized consensus formation process. 
So the miners are going to receive transactions, and they're going to you know, mine blocks, and those blocks are voted on with burning energy or in proof of stake, you know, set, uh, uh, some coin voting, and you know, they'll keep continuing to create more and more blocks, and great, great. And the users, if they want to know what the ordering of transactions are, they're going to look at that chain of votes. They're going to say, okay, I'm going to look at the heaviest or the longest chain. And they're going to say, okay, that means that the, you know, the white gerbil got the money first, and then the brown gerbil, and then so on. So now, what happens when those miners don't agree? Well, this is what we call forking. And so, which one do we choose? Well, once again, we choose the longest chain in this, you know, in this simple example. Now, this, you know, let's say if that fork grows a little bit longer. Well, now which one do we choose? We choose this new fork. And what does that mean? That means that the two transactions that are now in that that were in that other chain, but now are not included in our chain. Those ones we're not going to count anymore, and instead we're going to count the transactions that are in our new fork. Now, this is called a reorg, and this is not good. This is <laughs> very, very bad. You don't want your transaction to think it went through and then actually didn't. So, what does this mean? Well, we actually have this property where there are not too many reorgs, and that is because we have this like honest majority assumption or whatever your security model is. So in this case, we have mostly honest miners or rational miners, depending on your, your, your model, and that's okay, so we don't get too many reorgs. And if you wait you know, six block confirmations, for instance, then you won't get you know, any, essentially. So, this, but there is a bit of an issue. If our bad cat comes in and spends a bunch of money to kind of hire a bunch of uh, evil miners or maybe bribe the miners that already exist, then we can tip the balance and actually break our not too many reorgs property that we so cherish. So, what we want to do is we want to take this, right now it's $500,000 in my silly example, we want to take that $500,000 and make it you know, $500 million, or maybe $5 billion, or maybe $10 billion, whatever it is, so that the miner or the attacker cannot actually afford to make that attack. And so we're going to do that with some plasma fun. And so, what are we going to learn with this stuff? So we're going to learn consensus protocols, proof of work, proof of stake, honest majority or honesty assumptions, and bribing attacker model, griefing analysis, fault analysis, and all of these different, you know, different things that essentially is what we use to build things like Casper and build things, you know, all 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 of these kinds of uh, decentralized protocols. Now. And, of course, more synchrony assumptions. So, using Plasma. So just a really quick way. So we take, we take our less secure chain and we turn it into a more secure Plasma chain. Now, of course, the Plasma chain... Okay, so on, on, the, le on the left... On the left, we see the um, uh, 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 main chain, which is our like secure root chain. So Ethereum is secure because we have a whole lot of interest in that chain and a lot of people mining it, and that means that there's you know a, it's very hard to 51% attack. But our little you know side chain that we're creating for this course is not going to have that kind of security. So we want to plasmify it. So what does that actually do? The cost of 51%ing attack this root chain is 500 million. Cost of 51%ing our like little toy chain is 500,000. And so we want the security to be 500 million. Well, what do we do? We have some you know, you, miners on our, on our little chain, and they're creating blocks just like before. Those blocks can contain transactions, and those transactions send to a whole bunch of users. Then those blocks actually get submitted, commitments of those blocks get submitted to the more secure root chain, and they get mined in the root chain. So that's where we get our security. And so we do this again. We send our, 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 our blocks to the root chain, or commitments of them. We use like Merkle trees and stuff for this, uh, you know, to actually get this. And so instead of the users looking at our chain to, for the, you know, real transaction history, they instead look at the root chain, which is more secure. We, they look at the commitments on that root chain. And so if a bad cat attacker comes in, spends $500,000, and creates an invalid block, well, our users are going to submit evidence that they actually are the ones that control their coins on the root chain. The coins are, you know, the, the real source of truth for those coins is the root chain. And so what that does is that gives them the evidence to actually prove, you know, and receive the coins back 
in not, you know, have him stolen from this, you know, attacker guy. So the attack failed, and we get this uh, higher level of security. We get the $500 million of security instead of our $500,000, and that is thanks to stuff like Plasma. And so, go Plasma. So we'll learn a lot about layer two scaling solutions, like state channels, like Plasma. You can kind of mix and match a whole lot of these tools to actually provide really important guarantees and give our users you know, a good user experience. So for instance, what we can do is we can say, okay, our, our uh, um, uh, you know, plasma chain will have bonds that will get burned if the plasma chain is, to, is ever going to kind of uh, uh, misbehave. So we can add even more guarantees, essentially. So we're also going to talk about accumulators like Merkle trees, which is actually what those commitments are. So when we submit those blocks to the root chain, we're actually submitting the root of a Merkle tree. And that root of the Merkle tree allows us to prove membership of transactions later on. So if there's ever a conflict, we can, you know, we have a source of truth. But the important thing is we're not actually submitting all of the information. We're only submitting a small portion. So we're only submitting these you know, fault proofs if something goes wrong. And so also we're going to talk about block withholding, so people creating blocks that don't actually, you know, uh, uh, and not publishing the data. And we'll talk even more about cryptography, onion hashing, and uh, ZK snarks, and ZK starks, and all of the different kind of tools that are in our tool belt as we build these things, and some more crypto economic mechanisms. So, kind of wrapping up, we've got this, this central operator, we turn it into Bitcoin, we turn it into Plasma, and we're going to have a book that goes along with this. So Jing is actually working on, you know, creating, creating this book along with the rest of the community, you know, everyone's basically involved. And this is going to be kind of a, a A to Z uh, uh, thing that goes over each one of these tools in more detail, and you can kind of use it as you watch the lectures. And there's also a coding project, and this coding project is going to you know, uh, implement all of these things. I feel like it's really important that we not only talk about all of these architectures, but that we actually also implement them and use them. So, learn crypto economics, where to learn more, right? So this is, it's cryptoeconomics.study, reasonably easy to remember. And once again, there's some lectures, there's a book, there's a form, and the form is actually quite, quite active. And it's important that we do this, right? <laughs> Love no, knows no boundaries. Because where we are, uh, this is not just us, right? This is, you know, Vitalik is helping, Vlad has been helping, every, you know, there, there's so many people that have been working on this thing. An insane number of people, apparently. Um, and so, and it's really important that we take the, the kind of knowledge of how to build these systems and we decentralize it. Right now, this is, you know, this is the decentralized movement, right? And these, are, these protocols that we're building are supposed to give better security guarantees for our web applications. And so to do this, we need to make sure that everyone understands how to build these systems so that people can build economic mechanisms for you know, things that I can't think about. And we can also accelerate the growth and keep this decentralization alive. And part of that is also keeping it open source. So, for instance, you know, please you get involved, right? This is not a project that I am doing. This is not a project that Jing is doing. This is not a project that any single person is doing. It is a project that we are all doing together. This is a movement for the betterment of us, right? So cryptoeconomics.study, this is a nice puppy. Cute puppy, I'm really happy about it. Um, yeah, I mean, so <laughs> it actually, so one, one kind of note, right, I, something that I have learned so far working on this course, doing this in an open source manner has been an incredible boon. So I, I talked about how the, the uh, first chapter was actually written by some someone that I don't know, right? And this, the, and community members have been giving feedback at every step, and it has been terrifying because I don't want to, you know, release something and then throw away my work and kind of embarrass myself, and I embarrass myself all the time, and it's insane. So, so, so getting over the kind of fear of doing something wrong has actually provided so many benefits, and also the fear of people kind of copying your stuff or, you know, taking your stuff and doing something with it that you don't really want. This has been a hard thing to tackle, but it has been incredibly valuable with, you know, the fact that we have, you know, a GitHub repo that people are contributing to. We have 
uh, you know, people getting uh, involved on the forum. We have people giving feedback in the community calls. We, this is a you know, general movement, and so I'm really, really grateful for everyone who has contributed. And I want to see everyone here, everyone you know, building web applications to build them for the right reasons and provide good guarantees so that everyone doesn't have to worry about, is my data going to be stolen? Are, you know, are, is my money under my control? Is my, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Or, you know, is, my, is our internet robust enough for the AI revolution? Who knows? So <laughs> that is crypto economics that study. Looking forward to seeing you all, and, and thank you so much. <laughs>